Classic of difficulties. So that's yin and yang. But there's also this other foundational concept, the five elements, or the five phases. So there's five of them, in order, wood, fire, earth, metal, water. So that's the five phases. We'll call it that for clarity, because it's really kind of different than the Greek four elements. The Greek idea of the elements was that, and I am simplifying here, um, if you broke something apart into its smallest pieces, you would see tiny little chunks of elements. So if you took like a magical Greek microscope and you looked at water, all you would see in that water is tiny little waters. And if you took a look at fire, it would all be fire. But if you looked at boiling water, you would see mostly water, but there would be some little fires mixed in. The Greek word stoicheia, which is elements, it implies a bunch of things in a line. It's the same word that's used for the alphabet, and the same word for Euclid's elements, for all you geometry nerds. So, just like the words in Greek are made up of letters, which have some kind of innate ordering principle, the whole world in Greek is made up of the elements. They're like the alphabet of the universe. But remember, the Chinese don't have an alphabet. Pretty crazy. The language is all just little pictures. So all of that cool stuff that you can do with the Hebrew alphabet and biblical analysis or in the Kabbalah, it can't happen in Chinese. So you might guess that without an alphabet, the way that the Chinese see the world is very, very different. So the five phases, it's not an alphabet. The word phase really emphasizes a process of constant change. The character in Chinese really means stepping or walking. The five walks would be an alternate translation. But the thing that makes the five phases so unique and such a powerful theoretical tool is this concept of systematic correspondences. Basically, it's another one of those microcosm-macrocosm things, but it's like applied to everything. So wood, the first element, corresponds to spring, and fire, the second element, corresponds to summer. But wood also corresponds to the liver, and also to anger, and also to the color green, and also to beans. And fire corresponds to the heart, and to joy, and to red, and to peaches. And the list goes on. It literally goes on infinitely. Just like you can categorize everything in the universe under yin and yang, you can also categorize it under the five phases. And this is the foundation of Chinese science, by the way. Just like in the West, where you had intellectuals and scholars trying to improve upon others' ideas, critiquing and developing them, and also writing some pretty scathing letters in the process, the same exact thing was happening in China. But unlike in the West, where they were busy talking about phlogiston and vacuum tubes and flowers of vitriol and the weight of the air, which would all eventually become the basis of modern Western science, the intellectuals in China were just talking about the universe in terms of yin and yang the five elements, the eight trigrams, and other theoretical foundations. In many ways, the system is just as advanced as the Western sciences. The difference really lies in the end goals. Why do we want to develop this advanced knowledge, and what purpose does it serve? Do we perhaps want to live a better, more virtuous life in harmony with nature? Or do we want to reinforce our belief in the supremacy of the current emperor? Or maybe we just want to control nature and make as many iPhones as possible. Ancient Chinese thought isn't really any good at making iPhones, but I don't think that that's what they were going for anyways. 